Hey, what's going on? Welcome to the channel. Welcome to the B-Side Podcast. Now, this week's show is going to be a little shorter than normal because I didn't get a chance to watch the whole episode of Impact from Friday. So this one's just going to be on a couple news topics. Going to be giving you a health update on Brian Cage, talking about the Tennille Dashwood contract status, what's going on with Killer Cross right now, and then there's another rumor that always happens around Bound for Glory time, and that's talent not getting paid. Before I get into the podcast, this is a little bit of a cheap plug. I did this in my last video. I've got a friend who's trying to get on the cover of Maxim Magazine, so in the pinned comment of this upload, you can uh, click to vote for her. I'd really appreciate it. You have until September 12th to do so. And if you do so, leave me a comment. Let me know that you did and would be greatly appreciate it. And with that being said, it is now time for the B-side. One, two, one, two, you know how we do it is your boy BQ, and this is the B-Side Podcast. Did not get a chance to watch the entire episode of Impact this past week. I did watch the first 45 minutes, and I actually had three days off since then, but just just really busy with family stuff and personal stuff, and really haven't got a chance to just sit down and watch. So I'm going to try to catch up on it tonight. I still wanted to do the podcast this week because the, you know, the reviews are more done by the uh, Total Nonstop Impact guys. So if you're subscribed to me, whether it's YouTube or wherever you stream your podcast, you get a chance to listen to their review also. And they always do a really, really good job. And this past one on YouTube they did was a live review. So pretty good shit. Let's get into some topics at hand. Um, I'm going to talk about Brian Cage a little bit, Tanil Dashwood. Killer Cross, and then that rumor that comes around every year Bound for Glory. <laughs> every year, folks. First, let's talk Brian Cage. Uh, I got a, the opportunity to meet the machine just a few days ago, and a uh, really nice guy. And he, um, he had a match with Michael Elgin. All right, so I knew he was on the card. Was a little concerned with what he was going to be doing on, you know, if he was even going to wrestle. Because at Warrior Wrestling, which is in Chicago, he is, uh, he's the champ there. He's the guy. So uh, Michael Elgin was there in the place to be. Um, Tessa Blanchard and Daga wrestled against the Lucha Brothers. Killer Cross was there. Andrew Everett was there. And he's got a funny gimmick where he's Andrew the Giant and uh, acts like Andre the Giant. So it's kind of weird, but, I mean, it works on the indies. Neither here nor there. Let's talk Brian Cage. So uh, I was told, Trent looked into this prior, but um, he had told me Brian Cage was going to go, was, he was going to wrestle, but he was going to go, you know, wasn't going to go full speed. So watch the match, watch the main event, was there for a live. I'll say the, I'll say he probably went 70%. Yeah, he did, he did a majority of his moveset. I'll just say he didn't, he didn't take any major, major bumps, but I mean, he did go through a table at one point. Uh, I want to say... It was maybe a no disqualification match, but he had a good match with Michael Elgin and it was pretty hard hitting. So they didn't, you know, just phone it in, but it wasn't something we would see at Bound for Glory. You know what I mean? Or uh, even on an episode of Impact for that matter. But Brian Cage looked good. He sounded good. After the match, he cut a promo. So th this this match was recorded. The, the event was recorded and I don't know exactly you know, if it's for, for DVD or, or what exactly they're doing with it. But he cut a promo after the match. He did win. He did beat Michael Elgin with the drill claw. And he said Sammy Callahan. You know, the promo was for Sammy Callahan, not anybody else. He stopped short of saying that they were he was going to take on Callahan at Bound for Glory, though. He just let him know, I'm ready. We're going to do this. I am healthy. I'm ready to go. So... In his own words, his own words, he is he is good. Uh, I know he had a stem cell procedure done that that uh, apparently went really well. But in his own words, he's healthy, he's good to go, and he's looking forward to Sammy Callahan. So as I said, they stopped short of saying Bound for Glory. So when I did my Bound for Glory predictions, I had actually said that I, I think Callahan is going to take on Blanchard. I think... Callahan's going to get his world title shot in a taped episode of Impact. I hope it's at Bound for Glory. I really do. I mean, he bound, he main evented Slammiversary, so I think he deserves the opportunity to main event Bound for Glory. 
So we'll see, folks. We will see. Tanil Dashwood. So her contract apparently is a very short-term contract that runs through Bound for Glory. So this is a per-night deal. I don't think that's going to stop Impact <laughs> from, from making her look really strong. I predict she's going to challenge for the Knockouts Championship at Bound for Glory. I think she's going to win. But if she doesn't expect to stay with Impact long term, then it's probably not a good idea to do that. But don't, you know, don't fret. Don't worry. Because Tessa Blanchard, when she showed up at Bound for Glory a couple of years ago, it's hard to believe it was a couple of years ago already. When Tessa Blanchard showed up, she wasn't under contract for a while. You know, and they added her to the knockout page just like they did with Tanil. She wasn't under the con- contract right away. I don't think she was under contract until maybe January or February. So that means she showed up at, showed up at Bound for Glory and was uncontracted, was doing per night deals for November and December. So don't fret. That doesn't mean that the opportunity isn't there to resign to nil uh, long term. But I will say there's a big difference between her and Tessa Blanchard in the fact that uh Tessa really didn't have another competitive. I guess Impact didn't have another bidder is what I'm saying to bring Tessa. For whatever reason, NXT and WWE have had no interest in her. And, of course, you'll see the marks on Facebook, Twitter saying, oh, you know, we need Tessa versus Charlotte. That story writes writes itself. I told someone the other day, you're giving WWE way too much credit if you think they're going to they're gonna do something like that. Because we're past the days of you know, Stone Cold and The Rock, where they want to have these multiple main eventers. Like, when you watch that company now, it's clear that that Reigns and Charlotte are just who they're pushing, you know? You can say, well, Rollins this, Lynch this. They have two people, one in each division that they're pushing. So if you think that Tessa Blanchard is going to go over there and be on the level of Charlotte, you're mistaken. I know we're talking about Tennille here, but I'm making my point that with Tessa, you know, they didn't really have interest in her. And maybe they do. I'm sure they will in the future. You know what I mean? They're going to they're gonna take anybody over there. They're going to do whatever it takes to keep anybody away from AEW. But the difference is that was the only option for Tessa. Uh, Women of Honor wasn't really doing a whole lot at the time. You know, I don't even know if they were established at that time. So really, you know, Impact Wrestling was the place to be. Especially, you know, because the knockout division always delivers for the females. This time around, you know, now granted, she just left Ring of Honor, so that's not an option anymore. But this time around, AEW is out there. And then there's also that possibility that, you know, NXT might say, oh, crap, you know what? Tanil appeared at AEW. She's on Impact. Uh, maybe we need to bring Emma back. And, you know, that's always really possible with that company because you can't put anything past them. And I think that's what gives us an opportunity, though, with Tessa to kind of go back to where, what I was saying with that. I think that gives impact an opportunity to keep her because she's not going to get that Charlotte push over there. She's too, the gimmicks are too similar. You know what I mean? And they're not even gimmicks. They're real life. So I think impact is going to be bidding against AEW for her, but to nil, I think we're going to be, uh, I think there's going to be a good, a, a much stronger interest in her services at the time that she's, you know, done with Bound for Glory than than what happened with Tessa. So there there's some there's some differences here. I think though from a business standpoint that I you know, that this isn't like they're bringing on RVD or uh Ken Shamrock who they know is just going to be here for a few months. I would imagine and this Tessa said the same thing, you know, I came on board with the you know, assumption that we were going to talk long term. So I'm under the assumption that, you know, the conversation will be had, you know, and the opportunity will be there to keep her long term. And hopefully that's what happens. But she is just signed for Bound for Glory. So she's not even really and she's just on a per night deal. So, I mean, even though the roster page says, oh, well, she's an impact wrestling knockout, you know, social media is like we signed to Neil Dashwood. Like she could be gone in a couple months. Let's hope that doesn't happen. And if you watched her in the. AEW Casino Women's Battle Royal. She looked like a jobber out there. Uh, they, they made a lot of the women look like jobbers. I hope that women's wrestling fans and women wrestlers saw that and said, okay. Like, the AEW Battle Royal was booked more like a WWE 
women's battle royal than it was an impact one. I'll put it like that. So the impact had a they, the impact had a uh, knockouts had a battle royal in Vegas not too long ago. That was the one that Glenn, Glenn uh, Gilberti won. But if you guys remember that, it, it it got some time, but but it went for a good while before somebody got eliminated. You know, people got an opportunity to show what they can do. They had women that were local competitors in that match who were getting offense in. They didn't just like job out, you know. And if you watch the AEW one. I mean, you see Priscilla Kelly, uh, Leva Bates, um, Tennille Dashwood, obviously, uh, Eva Lise. I mean, lasting three minutes in this thing. So I, I'd be curious to see if, if Tennille looks at that situation. And, yeah, you know what? The women division isn't, we don't know what to expect there yet. With the knockouts, you know, you always know what to expect. You've always known what to expect with the knockouts. So even though there's going to be a bigger audience for AEW, um, I am hoping, you know, the timing is bad because that's when they're coming, you know, starting their TV program. And from what Brandy Rhodes is saying, they're going to make sure that the girls they have under under contract right now on the roster, that the fans get to know them first before they start bringing new girls in. So that statement being said, whoever signed over over there currently is going to have priority for a little while. You know what I mean? So. Let's just hope that we can to nil stays long term. I think the opportunity is going to be there. Uh, there's there's going to be some demand for her services, but the opportunity will be there to stick with Impact. So I said that I met Brian Cage the other day. I also met Killer Cross, and Cross is a really nice guy. Also, he's been someone I've been wanting to meet for a long time, and. Uh, he had a show and uh, he did, he did an event in Los Angeles not too long ago and my brother got an opportunity to go down there and meet him and got me a shirt and said yeah he was really cool and I've been he my dad um used to live in Vegas so Cross was doing autograph signings and stuff there and I would try to get my dad to go out there you know I never knew if the opportunity was going to be there for me to meet Cross but I you know I wanted my eight by tens and all that he came out at this show and um you know, he had his impact theme and, and Titan Tron entrance. And my, my kids really popped when they saw his, his logo. Cause I didn't tell him he was going to be wrestling, but he was really good, really nice, really nice to my kids. But apparently when he deals with impact now, this is, uh, I believe fightful.com is the one that brought it up where he's been using a, an, an attorney. So, uh, anytime he makes contact with impact, it's th- uh, via attorney because he feels like there was a breach of contract. And now from what I understand, you know, remember Cross went 0 for 3 versus Eddie Edwards. And that was a few that had some real promise to it. And he did wear his Slammiversary trunks at this event the other night, by the way. But his Slammiversary, him and Eddie had a really good match. And he, he dressed the part. He looked the part. You know, he doesn't look like someone is like on his way out the door. But from what I understand, there was a burial that they did with him. And I guess Impact is trying to show that they're, you know, they're going to play hardball if you don't handle your business the right way. So the good thing is that it seems like everything's really amicable and every, everyone, the two sides get along fine, but the two sides also strongly believe in what they believe in, you know? So it's not ugly. It's not like the Hardys, but contract, uh, but cross believes in what he does in regarding his contract and his pay and impact believes what they do regarding the same, you know? So, but they are playing hardball in a sense that they're saying, you're not going to get on a podcast and, you know, put this information out there, but it really sucks because I think most of us like cross a lot. And I don't think creative did him a disservice by any means. I, in my opinion, he was in the title picture. I don't want to say too soon because I think he should have been there, but he was in when it was really like, uh, like it was really uh, full. I was trying to find the right word, but I don't want to say the wrong word. So I'm just going to keep it simple and say it was full. It was, it was oversaturated. It was, uh, yeah, I was going to say convoluted, but I don't know if that's the correct word. Uh, Cage was in it, you know, trying to get the title from impact. Moose was in it. And then you're throwing cross and they're doing a bunch of multi-man matches. And when you do these multi-man man matches, like to me that it devalues the title and it means nothing. You know, I think a one-on-one feud is what's what's really important. And he did get a, you know, victory over, non-title victory over Johnny Impact. But he took some losses from Johnny Impact early. And 
I think they did him a disservice in the way they presented him as a main eventer. You know, when he first debuted versus Falaba, I remember like Falaba was hitting him and doing this and this. It wasn't doing anything. You know, he was it was Undertaker esque. And I thought that that should have continued for a little while with Cross. You know, obviously you can't wrestle like that forever, but I think that should have continued. I think he should have got a match with KM the following week and pretty much no sold everything there and you know and build him up properly. But I think when Cross came aboard and he was cutting his promos and everything, I think we all looked at it like, hell yeah, this this is what we need. This is this is a guy, you know, great signing. And had an opportunity to be a really homegrown talent. Because he did a Global Force wrestling thing, and even though on the first episode of that he in a sense like kind of jobbed out to Bobby Roode. But it was more because he was inexperienced. That's how they, they sold it. And he sold an arm injury during the match, and they did a really good job of capitalizing on that. But I still kind of saw the like star potential in him, you know. I still really felt that he uh, he had that ability. So, uh, from what I'm understanding, his contract um, this isn't coming from him. From what I'm understanding, his contract is up after Bound for Glory, or or in October, or after October, or something like that, through October. And then at that point, I think we're going to see a uh, an official release from the company. And who knows what he's got in his future. Um, I, I would imagine, with what he did with AAA and Lucha Underground and Impact, I would I would imagine AEW and NXT will be knocking on his door. So I don't think Cross is going to be hurting for work by any stretch. But it it's it's really too bad because he could have had a really long long run with Impact. He could have been a great world champion. I really would have liked to see him stick around. And, you know, for whatever reason, the business side didn't happen the way both sides envisioned. The business relationship, I should, I should say, didn't happen the way that both sides envisioned. And now we don't get cross on TV at all. So that really sucks because he was kind of becoming my favorite. But again, nice guy, super nice guy I met. And um, you, you can't, I, I know we like to say a lot of fans like to be optimistic. Like, oh, we can replace this guy. We can replace him can't replace a guy like cross. Like he's such a natural. I mean, he's, there's nothing Roman Reigns does. That's better than what cross does. You know what I mean? And he looks the part. So the opportunities for there for him to be a real household name. Last thing on the agenda, this rumor always comes out during bound for glory. And it's funny, you know, bound for glory. I knew was coming this year. And I was like, you know what? It's, it's a different time with impact right now. Different management, different roster. I would be shocked if some some drama came around like it does every time in this year. I mean, it does every time. It's always something. And sure enough, here we are. I'm gonna try to look into this. Uh, I'm strict. I'm speaking right now, strictly off opinion, no fact whatsoever. I am gonna try to look into this and try to clarify it for next week's show. But apparently, it, this is over merchandise. You know. Fightful.com was the one who reported it, and they tried to flip this like, oh, well, you know, Impact is trying to save face by covering for their hotel expenses because some wrestlers are actually losing money being signed with Impact. You know, yada, yada, yada. Uh, I, but covering hotel expenses is, is much more beneficial at this point than, than paying someone their merch royalties. You know, so I, I think the two are totally unrelated. But they're different... In, in business, a lot of times in, in, in these companies, there's different pots of money. You know, we, we like to think, oh, just just everything's in this this one giant pot, and if they can do this, they can do that. They're different business entities. You know, they most likely got a completely different team in charge of merch and um, royalties than they do covering expenses, travel expenses, and everything. You know, you feel me on that? So, what I had reported about two and a half years ago, and this was something that I I, I was told. Is that at the time, because the, what the what it was was the rumor came out that Impact was getting zero dollars off their merchandise sales. From what I understood was the reason that was is because they actually received lump sums when the shirt came out, uh, just to avoid the messy royalty situation. So right now this is, and if that's that's true, which I think it was, this is very this is a different business model for impact for having to pay out royalties. And it's different than just saying, Hey, we're flipping the bill for these costs than to 
calculate, I think they do quarterly royalties, something like that. You know, an impact has never been a huge mover of merch. You know, if, if it was based solely off their online presence, you know, they probably wouldn't sell a whole lot. But I would imagine when they do their Impl Impact Plus and Twitch shows that they have merchandise stands. And when that happens and you go to a wrestling show and they have a merchandise stand, like usually you, a lot of those things sell out. You know, people I've known who have been to live shows, they have said there's merchandise stands and, and just, you know, the stuff was flying off the shelves. So I think we're in a time right now where the merch probably does a lot better than it does in the waning years of Dixie Carter. Uh, but, you know, I don't think they're getting rich off it by any means. And what they're saying in the report is that some wrestlers are not getting paid their merch royalties or they're getting what they feel to be undervalued, underpaid. But no one really knows what they're selling or what the numbers are. So a wrestler legally can audit the company and, and get those numbers. But I guess at current time, that's not necessarily happening. Is this being blown out of proportion? Who knows? You know, you know, the websites are going to put a spin on it to where, you know, the wrestlers were unhappy and everything. But we haven't heard about wrestlers being unhappy in a really long time. And even Cross is a situation where he wasn't happy with the situation and Scarlett wasn't happy with her situation, but it wasn't drama. So I am going to try to look into this a little bit further. You know, I am, I'm going to try to ask around with people I trust and see if I can find out exactly what's going on with it. But that, that's what's, you know, out there right now. And as I said, this is probably a new business model for Impact to to pay out royalties. And that's not always an easy thing to do because every, everyone's deal is a little different. Everything's structured a little bit different. It's it's much different in covering travel costs. It's just a diff, it's just different business, you know. But if they are behind, like, shame on them, you know. But even when Impact would, or I'm sorry, when the Dirt Chiefs would say, oh, well, TNA's behind on this and this, like, they always left out the there was communication between the company and the wrestlers to an extent. You know what I mean? It wasn't they just just decided not to give them anything. There was you know some deal of communication, and I feel like Impact's being run really well right now. So most of these rumors, there's some degree of truth to them. You know, it's it's been a while since someone's just pulled something out of their ass. Usually, what it is is there's some degree of truth, but the the wrestling journalists, you know, don't don't get the exact information because you know Denzel Washington said something one time where he had said you know the media these days they are more concerned with being first than they are being right you know they want to be the first one to run the story instead of running the correct information and maybe they might update it later but all the hits have already happened for the most part they're more concerned with being first than being right so I am your boy, BQ. I am going to do my best to try to get to the bottom of it. I don't know if I can or not. We'll see what information I can get, but I will give him my best shot. Thanks for listening to the B-Side podcast this week. I am your boy, and I will.